Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Human Challenge, where we explore all of the human challenges in today's world, the challenges of being human, and how we can challenge ourselves to be more human for the greater good. Today's episode is brought to you in partnership with the Migration Technology Monitor on a mission to monitor surveillance technologies, automation, and the use of artificial intelligence to screen, track, and make decisions about people on the move. Joining us today all the way from Uganda is Matthew Labari, co-founder and executive director of the Community Creativity for Development. Uh, he's working in Rhino Camp, Uganda, supporting refugee youth, women, and girls in learning about digital competence, repairing electronic devices, and the safe use of digital technologies. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Thank you, Vanessa. I'm so happy you're here. I love the project you're doing, and I was reading a little bit about your journey. and. Um, I don't know, like share with us, tell us all the journey, how you ended up in Uganda and how you ended up on this project. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so uh, grateful, you know, to have joined this conversation. And despite, you know, the challenges that we've been facing in connectivity, but of course, finally, we managed to, to get on board. Uh, <laughs> my journey to Uganda started in 2016. Uh, around uh, July, uh, when conflict started in my home country, and I was in a village, I mean, in a small town called Ye. And uh, that was the moment I, I graduated from uh, the university and was trying to settle and, you know, do something for my community. Then boom, things uh, started. And then I had to uh, get back to Uganda. It was so challenging on the way, but uh, uh, we, we managed, you know, to uh, to reach. Uh, we used a, a vehicle, hired vehicle, where one has to pay for the transport, and the transport that time was super expensive for one to to get on. So went and settled uh, in one of the uh, the town, but life was not so easy. And I had to move to, to the camp and get registered. And likely enough, we were welcomed and uh, resettled or put uh, given some piece of land and settled in the in the camp. I initially got registered in uh, Come, which is the biggest called PDB, the refugee settlement. But later on, uh, because of job, I had to to go and do something for the community, uh, where I can exercise my skills and help, you know, my fellow refugees. Then I moved to Rhino Cam refugee settlement, where I was so lucky that I managed to join. Uh, a refugee-led organization called uh, uh, Community Technology Empowerment Network, where I volunteered for a couple of time until 2019, uh, before uh, founding CC4D, or Community Creativity for Development. Uh, while we found Community Creativity for Development, we were three colleagues. Uh, uh, who were neighbors and then attended a training on uh, repair of uh, devices. And we had our first repair cafe in 2018, which was organized by in collaboration with uh, uh, an organization called uh, Rogue Agents, Open Culture for uh, Critical Transformation. Uh, it's a German-based organization. Uh, which uh, did the training uh, together with Community Technology Empowerment Network. So from that uh, repair cafe, we then realized there was a gap in uh, repair of everyday, you know, items such as mobile phone radios, uh, solar alarms, among other communication tools. That's enables the refugees to keep in touch with their, their loved ones. So uh, then we immediately uh, started the organization from uh, scratch. 
and likely we were able to knock doors on social media and manage to connect with the Restart Project, uh, which is a UK-based uh, initiative advocating for the right to repair, uh, which also they made us, you know, to shine. And today, whereby we got some funders and uh, attract many people, including the Rogue Agency, which is now the long-term funding partner. Uh, we also met a couple of friends from Sweden, like Jessica from Repair Cafe Malmo, and there's uh, Sergio from uh, Italy, who worked with ST Microelectronics, uh, who then supported us along the journey. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I, I love the kind of the organic journey of it, right? That it was like, you know, you were just sort of going into it and, and learning and listening and then responding to what community needed, right? And I think that's really amazing. You talked a little bit about repair and and I, I'm not familiar too much with this term, but I'd love for you to educate me a little bit more on what it means. What is the repair movement? What does that mean exactly? Well, thank you. Uh, the repair movement, uh, it's a movement that is being formed uh, as a result of plan oblations by manufacturers. Uh, so the aim is to uh, make devices repairable and to also help teach people around the world uh, uh, to repair their own, to have you know, ownership um, about their gadgets that they're held, they are, they are holding in their hands. In other words, like, it's a uh, movement that is aimed at uh, increasing awareness about uh, repair of uh, everyday items so that they can last longer. And so this is kind of where your your work comes in that you're doing at the Rhino Camp um, and I guess some of the work that your um, organization is doing as well, correct? Yeah, 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 exactly. But of course... Uh, uh, my entrance or my journey into repair, uh, you know, uh, it it started uh, some time back when I was still like a kid, a child. So I used to watch my dad, you know, repairing his uh, devices like the waste watch, the radio. But sometimes you could uh, further not uh, fix them, rather, you know, damage them more because of the <laughs> lack of knowledge and skills mm -hmm. <laughs> that he, he did not have. So I developed that passion and my dad inspired me a lot to, and that made me to, you know, to, to learn repair on my own and, and help teach people uh, how to repair their things. But I did not know the broader impact of repair beyond uh, making people repair their own devices. But also there were some scenarios that happened. Uh, one of it was uh, I was locked out of my phone. I could not access the apps, my phone. So I took it to a repair technician. Unfortunately, uh, the repair technicians could not make me uh, see how he was fixing my, my phone but I had to stand somewhere where I could see what he was doing. Uh, so, and he charged me a lot of money. So I together with my friend and later on, I took my own phone and tried to unlock it. I mean, lock it and unlock it. Uh, so that was uh, scenario number two. And another scenario number three was my computer got a problem but then I could not fix it. So I took it to a technician and instead of fixing it, the technician decided to, to take some components out of it. And I was super annoyed. And I say, uh, that is so unethical, like mm -hmm. taking something uh, that is being brought for repair and you started to pick things out, some component mm -hmm. out without letting the owner know and that is unacceptable. So mm -hmm. all those three scenarios uh, 
inspired me or made me to learn repair and to ensure that repair is done in an ethical manner so that like if one is repairing do not uh, pick any component uh, from the devices even if it's no longer functioning don't pick it without the knowledge of the, the owner wow yeah absolutely that's that's horrible i i yeah absolutely like you said, just unacceptable that's that's terrible i'm really sorry that that happened um and so where did you learn your your skills about repair then well i i first of all i i attended university where i did uh, information technology uh but then repair uh was was not done fully and after when i finished my 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 diploma in information technology i I then started, you know, watching videos, uh, online videos um, about repair. And even when I was at the university, I could sit and watch things related to repair. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I watch them. YouTube has helped me a lot in uh, setting up my acquiring the knowledge and skills related to repair. So you're completely self-taught. All your all your <laughs> repair skills are completely self-taught. That's amazing. And now you do it for a living. That's fantastic. I love that so much. Um, uh, can we go a little bit into more detail about the project at Rhino Camp uh, Uganda with the ref refugee youth, women, and girls? Um, how it came about, and some of the some of the things that you do there. Well, uh, thank you about the projects that we we. We did on uh, women and girls empowerment in uh, uh, in the refugee camps related to repair and digital literacy. Is that um, while we were doing the the repair work, we we found out that there was less involvement of the women at women. I mean, women involvement in repair of especially electronic devices. So many of the women were uh, more uh, participating in uh, maintenance of houses, like insides of the houses, maybe maintenance of household utensils, like cleaning them, but they were not much into repair of electronics. Uh, and uh, from conversations that we we had with some women uh, was that it the the work of repair it's a technical work that can be done with uh, by men and they cannot you know manage to do that and secondly um, there is this aspect of uh, the cultural norms that does not permit like women to mm -hmm. be as technicians. Uh, but also women, uh, you know, sees that since repair is a technical thing and they fear of, you know, breaking things, like they think if they try to repair something and it breaks, uh, it brings some issues to them, like them being blamed about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, but also uh, the lack of exposure of women into or mentorship of women to uh, to do kind of repairs, and this becomes a great challenge to them and hindering them to uh, to participate. And one of the the aspect that we we try to do was uh, first we we gathered some data collection about what they could repair and most of them were trying to to pick repair of clothes like going for tailoring and repair of footwears but they say why don't you try to do the repair and our first repair uh project for women was in 2022 when we successfully held a small repair cafe event 
and to women it was so exciting that uh, women showed their skills and when they fixed the radio they were super happy and they celebrated with a lot of joy and dance <laughs> yeah and um uh this year early this year when uh, uh last year we produced um a research on the essence of prepare culture in displacement settings also mm. those challenges you know popped up uh in the research and uh I'm so thankful that you know that research has led to the birth of the project with the maintenance, I mean with the migration and technology monitor, which is MDR. Also teaching young uh, women and girls in repair uh, of electronic devices, you know, or integration of digital skills and repair uh, together, and. Um, this project has come as you know a follow up to the research that happened in 2023 i uh i think that's really amazing i really do and um i i think you know based on what i know of the migration technology monitor uh they do amazing work um and i know i can definitely see how this would be uh, extremely aligned with a lot of the things that they aim to do. Um, I'm curious because I know there was a little bit around, or you talked a lot about repairing electronic devices. Um, but what I also remember is that I think you do a lot of work around also teaching youth, women, and girls, especially safe use of digital technologies, right? Like how to use like cybersecurity and all that. And so I'm curious, I'm curious what that looks like, um, how you how you teach them that, I suppose, and when we talk about specifically displacement settings, um, you know, are there additional things that have to be considered around cybersecurity? Yes, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> one thing that I, I did not mention earlier about the issue of the cybersecurity, uh, I think before I joined the Refugee Cup, I I was a victim of uh, cyber security. Uh, one of it is uh, my social media account was uh, was hacked and I did not recover. Mm. Secondly, uh, I was scammed through you know these uh, uh, telecom companies, mobile money scammers, where they called into it. It was like, hey, you have won, you know some. Uh, some goodies and mm -hmm. it requires uh, you need to send uh, around 5,000 Ugandan shillings to so that we can be able to to clear your goodies. So I was, you know, uh, a victim of scam and mm -hmm. after being scam and I read about scams, then I realized there's that need to uh, to let people know about those dangers uh, of cybersecurity. Uh, it was not only me that had been a victim of scam, but also a lot of friends were being scammed. Some lost mm -hmm. money, like uh, more than 200 uh, US dollars uh, due to online scams. Some uh, like scam from email scams. They got like mails or text messages that they <laughs> want um, uh, some vehicles or a price, but of course they also need to clear that price to pay something in order to to uh, to get uh, what they have won. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the refugees went into borrowing money from colleagues in the hopes that they are going to get that bigger price. Like go some. Uh, I still remember one of my friends uh, got an information that he uh, has won uh, money, what, one million US dollars. So, <laughs> but for him to, for the money to be cleared, to be deposited to his account, so there are some procedures that he he had to follow. Yeah. And he has to get in contact with other people whom they were uh, 
uh, he was uh, referred to and of course requires payment after payment and mm -hmm. by the end of the time when they realized i mean when he sent the money uh the scammers you know cut off communication they put on their phones and they could not communicate to them and that was the time that uh my colleagues uh, realized that they were i mean she was scammed mm -hmm. uh, but but not only uh, scam related to money uh, there are also these cyber security issues where accounts many accounts of my friends were hacked and whenever they are hacked uh, the hacker does not only when targets them and it keeps on escalating to many of the friends within uh, the victim who has been hacked and it mm -hmm. cycles like more than one person being hacked among that cycles because of the lack of knowledge and skills on identifying uh, how uh, scammers you know behave so mm -hmm. it becomes very hard for them to to notice that and they lost a lot of many uh, social media accounts many emails where they could not manage to to recover them and they end up creating other new accounts so based on all those scenarios and we felt like uh, it's high time to uh, to teach uh, fellow refugees how they can protect themselves against uh, being scammed or such uh, cyber security issues and how they can identify uh, legitimate information from those information which are fake. I'm curious when we talk about cybersecurity, um, are there additional things that that people have to consider when we're in displaced settings around cybersecurity? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, around cybersecurity, of course, in displacement communities, since displacement communities, uh, they have the right to access to access to information or to digital connectivity, uh, there are things that they need to consider regarding uh, how they can be safe uh, or how they can access information safely. And uh, they have uh, the rights to be trained on uh, how to keep themselves safely uh, from being, uh, or they need to be aware of cyber uh crime or cyber related issues you know the the name refugee uh it's it's just the name but does not change at all um the person's um mm -hmm. belonging so mm -hmm. uh it's refugee is it's just uh i would say it's a title <laughs> given to someone who's a displaced person but does mm -hmm. not change like the rights to uh to his data uh one of the things i think that uh, sparked also some doubts some time back was the issue of uh, verification issues uh, mm -hmm. i i still do do remember uh, the, the exact dates i i still don't know but it was around 2000 i think uh, around 2019 or, or 18 when there was a, uh, an exercise of verification of refugees uh, where there was a biometric uh, scan and there's, uh, one has to also, there was a retina scan where one has to look into those devices. Mm -hmm. And many refugees were worried of, of what was happening, whether there's yeah. an impact of those uh, technologies. Yeah. And because they they were not aware of how those things are going to be used, uh, it brought a lot of fear and questions, you know, among the uh, the refugees. And one of the things, data is very important. Data is is very important part uh, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to cyber security issues. When it's not clearly 
uh, defined how the data is going to be used, this raises a lot of questions and uh, stealing of people's information, uh, personal information. Uh, it's something because at the end, when this data is collected from the refugees, where does this data end? That becomes mm -hmm. a, a, a question. Does it end with only one partner or it's going to be spread uh, among different, you know, stakeholders? Right. And I, I remember some of that from um, from Petra's book and from our conversation. Um, yeah. Wow. I, I and I, I definitely I, I definitely hear that that concern. I think that would be um, that would be, I think, um, just a huge risk and something that I can imagine people needing to be empowered or feeling empowered over, which is where I think a lot of your work comes in. So I think that's really amazing. Um, I want to say thank you for coming on the show. I'm really grateful, really grateful for your work. I know we had some connection issues, but I'm really grateful that we were still able to connect and uh, share your work. I'm also going to share the report that you referenced. I'm going to share that as well in the description so people can can read and learn more about it. Um, how can we stay in touch with you and the work that you do? Yeah, thank you. Uh, to, to keep in touch with us, we are, of course, uh, available online. We have presence uh, uh, online. And, of course, I can be reached via email. And um, uh, via email or uh, we're also available on WhatsApp. But our website is it's open and we have quite um, uh, emails there in our website of the Community Creativity for Development. Uh, but also, uh, personally, I'm also reached on LinkedIn. I have presence on LinkedIn, on uh, Facebook, uh, but also uh, uh, I have also a presence on uh, Twitter, including uh, Instagram. Yeah. So we can, I can be reached in, in all those platforms. Amazing. So I will share all those links then in the description as well. Thank you so much, Matthew, for coming on the show. And uh, we will absolutely be in touch. Thank you.